Let's talk about an important topic that almost no software engineer talks about in Europe, and this is compensation for software engineers. Hey, this is Gary Go, the Pragmatic Engineer. Thank you so much for everyone who's filled out this anonymous survey. Submitting your salary, your base salary, your bonuses, and your equity on how much you're making in total. Now, we could just spin through all the numbers that I've gathered and look at how the numbers are going from the low 30s all the way to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 100s, all the way to the higher numbers. The above 100, the above 150, and the above 200s. Now, we're not going to do this in this video. We're going to do it in one of the next ones. And the reason is that I've discovered something really interesting as I went through this data. And it's the fact that there's no one average salary in the software engineering industry. So for example, while Talon.io shares that the average salary in Amsterdam was zero to one years is 38, then 47, then 55, then above seven years is 60,000. They're not wrong, but they're also not right. And I want to walk you through why this is the case and why there is a trimodal nature of software engineering salaries, three very distinct groups. And this is definitely the fact in the Netherlands. And some of my friends have confirmed that this seems to be the case in Canada as well. So let's look at the typical salary distribution. And I'm going to use Netherlands numbers because I crunched those numbers. I'm pretty familiar with them, but we can apply this to a lot of European countries, as you'll see. Let's take the average salary and we're going to put it here. Now, this is that 60,000 euros that Talon that I was saying is the average for the Dutch market in terms of salary. And as I said, they are probably right. These will be the salaries for companies that I call hyper local. This means they're local companies. In this case, they're Amsterdam companies, for example, who hire from other Amsterdam companies and they're competing against other local companies. And examples for these companies might be local supermarkets, government agencies, the local post office, cable providers, and any other startup that is just competing only locally. They typically have local customers and they compete with the other local companies. And we are talking about salary in this case because salary is what most people get. Most of these places don't even pay bonuses and yeah, don't even dream about equity. Most people don't even know what equity is if you work at these places. Now we're going to have a second type of salary band, if you will. And if you notice, these are bands. It's not like it, they only pay this much. They could pay less, they could pay more, but there's some sort of distribution. And this is just based on my rough observation. So the real market data might not reflect this fully. Now, the second type of band is what I call the top of the local market. These are companies who want to hire, let's say from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, or from Berlin, London, wherever. And they want to get the best talent on that local market. And they want to pay better than this first category of companies because they know that that's how they're going to get the people in. Now, very important, we're starting to talk about total compensation now, not just salary. Total compensation means everything that you make it a whole year. And this will mean your salary, which will be a bigger portion of this, but it will also be a bonus. Some of these companies might have target bonuses. They'll say, if you meet expectations or if the company meets expectations, you're going to get 10 or 20% of your salary as bonus. And it might also include equity. Some of these companies are already starting to give out options, share appreciation rights, growth shares, RSUs, double trigger RSUs. If you're not sure what these mean, check out the article I wrote that's linked under there about equity for software engineers. Understanding how equity works becomes really important if you want to make up of a certain level as a software engineer, as an employee. Now, this second type of company will now pay more. So, for example, in Amsterdam, they'll pay somewhere in the range of 80 to 100,000 euros for senior engineers in total compensation. So, when I say 100,000 euros in total compensation, that might mean 9,000 euros in base salary and 10,000 euros in bonus. Or it could also be 60,000 in base salary and 40,000 in equity. Now, the interesting thing is that these will typically be the highest reported numbers you'll find on any public data source. Glassdoor, Payscale, or any of the recruitment websites which tell you the salary range. This is actually not the top of the market. They're not the largest packages that you might be able to get or negotiate. And this is the information that most people are not aware of, and it's a relatively new thing. A few years ago, we didn't have too many companies that would pay higher above this, but now we do. These are companies that pay top of the regional market, which means the most in Europe, or if you're in Canada, the most in Canada. They're no longer competing with Amsterdam or with London. London or with Barcelona or with wherever you're living, they're competing across all of Europe. How do I know this? I was a hiring manager at Uber in Amsterdam for four years and we benchmarked our salaries not for Amsterdam. We were paying way above Amsterdam. We were competing with Facebook in London, Google in Zurich, Twitter in Dublin, HashiCorp in London, Stripe, wherever they might be hiring. 
We're competing with those guys. Now, how do you compete? Well, we competed with total compensation. The base salary at Uber, for example, was not much higher than the number two category companies would pay, but the equity was a lot bigger and the target bonuses were also a lot bigger. A senior engineer at Uber in Amsterdam would make somewhere around 170 or 180,000 euros in their first year based on the default offer that we would give them. And for entry-level engineers with zero years experience, this would still be about 90,000 euros, which is a lot higher than you could get anywhere else. Now, for the breakdown of numbers, I wrote an article about the trimodal nature of software engineering salaries. Check it out in the link below and you can see more details there. Now, this range is really interesting because it's very wide, but also not many people will get it. In fact, very few people will, will get this in the whole population of any region of Amsterdam, of the Netherlands, wherever you are. But it does not mean that it does not exist. It exists but a lot of people don't know about it. Why not? It's because of two reasons. First, almost every compensation source in Europe focuses on salary. The salaries in this range are not gonna be as insanely high. For senior engineers, you're not gonna see a salary larger than 130,000 euros in Amsterdam in this range, even though total compensation might go up to 250,000. The other reason is people who work at these companies, they're not really gonna share this information. Why would you tell people that you're making this much money? Now, I used to be towards the very end of this chart in terms of how much I made when I used to work at Uber. And if I still worked at Uber, I would not be talking about how much I'm making there. It's, you just don't do it. When, when was the last time that you posted your salary on the internet? If you're in Europe, that is. In the US, people talk about salaries, that there's a lot more transparency, and it actually seems to help the market. People know their value. They will change companies if they're overpaid, which in turn makes companies want to pay more because they don't want to lose their best people. I think talking about salaries actually helps the market it helps employees some employers might disagree but that's just probably because they have a really good deal right now they're probably paying under the market so there we have it the salary landscape of most european countries in some markets the number one type of companies are dominant and there's very two number two and maybe very few number three in markets like Amsterdam, London, some of the other cities where there's a lot of big tech coming in, this number three category will be increasing nice and slowly. The other question is, which ones are these number three type of companies? For Amsterdam slash the Netherlands, I can tell you this includes Uber, Booking.com, Databricks, Flexport, Elastic, Redis Labs, Amazon, GitHub, GoDaddy. Almost all of them are US companies, except for Booking.com, who have been keeping up with the pace of pay pretty well. Another frequent question I get is, how can you get into these companies? And I'll tell you, it's really competitive. You saw how much more some of these companies can pay in total compensation, and it shows in the number of applicants. When I worked at Uber and we were hiring for new grads, we had about 500 qualified applications for only four positions. So to get one of these very few but highly paid positions, you had to be really, really good. And those people had a lot of practice beforehand, and some of them had a lot of relevant internship experience as well. Now, preparing for the big tech interviews in Europe is a whole different topic of itself. I'll probably do a video about it. But for now, check out an article that I wrote with advice on how to prepare for the coding and system design interviews that are just a given at these places. Now this video is about salaries, but I think it's important we talk about a few things that are not salary. Because frankly, some people will think that the most important things are salary, the company you work at, and your title, but I kind of disagree. Yes, compensation is important, especially that you have a fair compensation. And yes, your company name and job title can be important for your career. If you work at a company that is well known at a senior job title, it will be easier for you to get interviews later on. It keeps a lot of options open for you, honestly. But the people you work with on a day-to-day -day basis are just as important. Are you growing professionally? Are you becoming a better engineer every day? Your health will be important. Are you under too much stress? Is it affecting your personal life? That's probably not a great place to work at. Or maybe your physical health is suffering, or you might have some other things going on. Maybe you wanna take the back seat for work and focus on your health. I, every situation is different. How flexible is your work? Can you move your hours around? Can you accommodate other stuff that's going on in your life? Can you disconnect outside of work? For example, if you work at a number three type of company, let's say Uber or Amazon, and you're working with teams in San Francisco and in India, chances are you're gonna have really early meetings or really late meetings, or maybe even both. You might be on call for a week and you might be woken up at the middle of the night. It happened with me. How do you balance that versus the salary or the professional growth? Because now it's a really stressful job. And again, the answer will be different for everyone. I'll tell you that I actually didn't mind. I liked the high intensity work at Uber. After a while, it was more draining for me, but I was okay with it. I, I was able to do it. My family situation allowed it. It's not for everyone. And finally, your free time. Do you have free time? Do you feel that you can disconnect in your free time? 
When I joined Uber the first few months, I had zero free time. I couldn't disconnect. A lot of this was on me as well, but it was also rewriting the Uber app and me going to San Francisco and working crazy hours. It's a really fun story, a really intense story. I'll write about it or maybe even do a YouTube video about it at some point. It was memorable, let's put it that way. And some of my colleagues quit after this project. So, you know, it was high stress. Now, this salary chart will not show up, but the number one type of companies will typically have by far the best work-life balance. They still give you a really good salary for having a nine to five job. If you're in the Netherlands, these will be the places where a lot of people might work four days a week or even less, and it'll be totally okay to do it. Work will end at five or maybe even 4.30. There might be some good benefits in terms of pension. Now, the number two type of companies are typically a lot more competitive. In my experience, they do pay more, but they typically do expect more as well. If they're a local company, meaning they're in one time zone, probably won't have to do very late or very early hours. So for example, in booking.com, people log off at 5 p.m. from what I've heard, which is pretty awesome for the type of salary that people can get there. And the number three type of companies, as I mentioned, are typically the most stressful ones you typically work on really impactful, really important stuff. And if it breaks, you need to fix it. And I'll give you an example. The payment system that we had at Uber, every minute of downtime would have cost us roughly $100,000. Was it stressful when it went down? Yeah, and we also had a plan for it and we had automation and investment. It also meant that if you worked at this company, you worked on a massive system, you learned how to operate this reliably, and yeah, dealt with the initial outage. Between these companies, there's always a trade-off. And don't forget, it's not like you can just pick and choose. Oh, I wanna work at company one or company two or company three. Company three is really, really competitive. A lot of people wanna work there. It's hard to get in there. If you're working at a number one type of company, it can be really hard to change to number three type of company. You might not even make it through the resume screening. And by the way, if your resume is not getting through to number three type of companies, I wrote a book that might be helpful. You'll find it in the link below. Finally, if you're someone who's at the senior level or above, I'm writing some emails with some raw preparation advice on how I suggest preparing for senior engineer and engineering manager interviews at these number three big tech companies. If you're interested, sign up to those emails. All I ask is please don't forward that information elsewhere. I hope this overview was useful. In the next video, we're gonna look at specific numbers in the Netherlands, and in the following ones, we're gonna look at other country data that you've submitted. If you're a software engineer in Europe and you've not submitted your salary, please do so. It will help with a more complete and realistic picture of where salaries are in Europe right now. And don't forget to subscribe to not miss the next videos. See you in the next one.